Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mary Williamson's in the building. Thank Here you, you go. Um, she's running for president on the Democratic ticket. And uh, we we have some we have some questions. Okay. Yeah. Um I I uh, the the chat's already going crazy. They're very excited. Um before we get started, I'm going to really quickly do this. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um first and foremost, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh this is probably the weirdest interview that you've ever conducted. I suspect because, you know, how often do you go to a random person's house? And then sit in front of their weird back background and and talk to them. As you can see, everyone in the everyone that's watching just like respond in real time. Have you ever done one of these before? Well, first of all, you're not a random weird person. Second of all, most of my adult life has been spent in Los Angeles, so this doesn't look that weird to me. Okay, good. The, the part about everybody on the thing, of course, is yeah, is what it is. Yeah, um, you know that that part is that part is definitely strange. You've uh, you're in town. You're in. I mean, you're uh, doing some some media right now. Yes. Um, I saw you not recently, but you a while back went on the Dave Rubin show to explain yeah, to him. That was here, wasn't it? Yeah, uh -huh. to explain to him important concepts such as uh, systemic racism and how it exists. So that Something was that was pretty him, good. Apparently. Yeah, it's not even new to him. Hello. Um, you can sit in here if you want. Okay. Right there. Um, yeah, we can barely hear her. Okay. I'm going to try to see if I can boost your gain here, but you can just like yell a little bit or get a little bit closer to the oh, microphone. Okay. This is the best we got, unfortunately. <clears throat> um, anyway, um, today's probably going to be a little bit, uh, different than the normal, uh, interview that you get, uh, in the normal interview that you do, but I'm sure it'll be fine. we can talk about like different trends and culture, uh, especially considering that you have a lot of prominence on TikTok, you're 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 all over TikTok. You're more on TikTok than I am, I would say. Um, how do you feel about that? I feel seen and heard by young people. I and I understand it actually. My message to them has been that they're not even 20th century people, and they shouldn't live their lives at the effect of bad economic ideas left over from the 20th century. So I I feel seen and heard by them, but I think that's because they feel seen and heard by me. Okay, that's cool. Um, let me see. Let's do this real quick. Let's. They don't have an institutional memory of a time ever in their lives when it felt like government was on their side. And they feel that government policy, understandably they feel this way because it's fact, does more to thwart than to support their own dreams for self-actualization and living the lives they want to live. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, do you, I mean, why, let's, let's just start with why are you running? Like, what is your, what's your goal for uh, running on the Democratic ticket? Well, somebody has to say certain things. Uh, this country needs to start over. We need to end an aberrational chapter of neoliberalism in this country. We need to repudiate the corporate tyranny that now owns our Congress, owns our government, and has its tentacles in every corner of our civilization. To me, that's what the Democratic Party should be saying. And um, if uh, nobody's going to run for president saying it as a Democrat, I am. Okay. Um, I mean, that quite literally happened last time around with Joe Brandon. I mean, he uh, and I, I guess seven other candidates uh, directly ran in opposition to Medicare for all at a time when uh, this necessity is is uh, was only being voiced by one candidate, Bernie Sanders. Um, what are your uh, what are your has your perspective on Medicare for all and its viability changed over the years? Yeah. Yeah, I had a kind of amazing grace type of moment. Because last time I thought, well, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, we can get there. And uh, I did have a moment when I sort of got it. Yeah, we need Medicare for all. What was that for you? What was that moment know. of change? I don't actually remember it. I don't remember when it was. I don't remember if it was during the campaign or after. Forgive me, my phone is ringing. Don't worry. So, I just called Joe Biden, Joe Brandon. This is, not a, this is not supposed to be a professional interview. Just yeah. don't show it to the camera. Make sure that it's oh, like. okay. Yeah. I'm turning off my phone. So. Yeah. No, it's all good. Don't worry about it. It's just like, this is not supposed to be a professional interview by any means. This is the most professional I've been in a very long time, though. Why, you're um, on good behavior? I'm being, I'm being on my best behavior, yes. Um, so there was another guy who ran on a campaign of trying to improve turnout 
for uh, younger voters. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I mean, he's sitting right there uh, on a cutout. But uh, unfortunately, that didn't come to fruition. Do you have any other opinions on how to mobilize younger voters? Well, I have not made an effort to mobilize young voters. I mean, I'm grateful that they're responding, but I don't have any strategy like that. I'm seeking to tell the truth as I understand it. I want the American people of any age to have the option of a complete repudiation of this aberrational neoliberal chapter of American history. Uh, And we need to start over in this country. We need a new beginning. We need an emergency level transition from a dirty economy to a clean economy. We need to move from a war economy to a peace economy, and we need to push back against what is essentially a matrix of corporate corporate tyranny. So to me, whether you're 80 years old or 18 years old, uh, whether it's about the next 20 years of your life or the life of your grandchildren, it's about the state of our democracy and possibly the state of you know our humanity. Even the habitability of the planet could be at risk here. This is not a time to slow walk. It's not a time for incrementalism. It's not a time for endorsing someone that says the opposite of what I'm just saying because you think somehow the chess game of work in Washington uh, will help you get there. It's not time for any of that. And if um, none of them are going to say it, I am. And I think uh, there's a point to that, too. They become locked in by the system. And I think it will take, and Chuck was saying that, actually, it will take someone from outside, I think. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what kind of uh, mechanism for change do you think is necessary here beyond uh, just the bully pulpit? Because as the president, potentially... Um, you will have a lot of powers. Uh, how do you, uh, what do you think some of the greatest hurdles will be in, uh, uh, in, in uh, undermining or completely rewriting uh, a neoliberal, neoliberal organization of the economy? Well, first of all, every president, no matter who, is hoping for a House and Senate that is aligned with their thinking. So that will make a huge difference. But even if you don't, uh, you do have the power of executive orders. You have the power of the appointments of heads of agencies. You can certainly get rid of the corporatists who head the agencies in too many cases, even if you can't quite bring in the problem solvers, you know, depending on what they block and don't block. And you have the bully pulpit. And also, we all know that this needs to be an outside-inside strategy. So I think the revival revitalization of the labor movement. Organized labor right now is one of the biggest things going on. So one of the things you, they would really know that they had a partner in me, uh, whether it has to do with beefing up the National Labor Relations Board, whether it has to do with the PRO Act. To me, that inside-outside um, elements uh, would be fortified by my our presidency. So uh, you're, you're interested in beefing up the NLRB and uh, giving more power to workers so they can unionize. Yeah, absolutely. you have. So you're, what do you think about the strikes that are currently going on all around us in Hollywood? I mean, you've you've spent I was on the picket line the other day. Oh, yeah, it's uh, great. I saw. Yeah, that was great. Um, uh, what do you what's your what's your opinion on that uh, as far as um, well, what's going on? Uh, with the w- course, well, there are two elements and one element, of course, is the same with Starbucks. It's the same with Amazon. It's the same with the grad workers, uh, at certain schools, et cetera. And that simply has to do with how baked into the cake it is that stockholders and CEOs um, and their stock dividends and their stock buybacks, this profound and really immoral transfer of wealth into the hands of a very tiny few, um, under the canard that they would create jobs. Of course, their business model is not job creation. Their business model is job elimination and job and worker exploitation. So it's very fantastic, you know, uh, the response of the first Gilded Age was the establishment of organized labor, and the response of the second uh, Gilded Age, which we're living in, is its repudiation. I think it's extremely important. Now, in addition to that, you know, when I first, I would do interviews, and I before sag after got in, and it was just the writers, they were talking about things like they, a writer used to be hired to stay for the duration of the development of the script, right? And then they started doing this thing where, oh, we only need you for scene one and scene three. So then that writer has to go work somewhere else to see if there's a scene two or scene four that he can work on or she and of course this is also to the denigration of the the product itself so that's first of all just the dignity and the and the living wage issue and the decency all of that we understand all of that but with the sag after thing this is this added element of ai i mean it's extraordinary you could take that they 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 make you sign away in perpetuity your image that they could use in another movie no it's terrible and i think fran drescher is doing a bang-up job and i think she's making it clear you know 
during the last campaign, Andrew Yang had written a book, uh, The War on Normal People. And that was the first book that I read that actually I got it about the threat of AI. And I remember one of the things that he says in that book is don't kid yourself. You might think you have a job where only you could do it. I mean, even like lawyers, they're talking about that now. Don't bother to go to law school because of all of that. So I well, think but Andrew Yang's solutions were, uh, you know, not necessarily great, in my opinion. That, oh, definitely. That's not what I'm talking about here. Yeah. I'm just talking about the whole issue of AI. And I think, and, and fencing it in and realizing what a threat it represents. And not only to, to the issue of work, this could be bigger than that. So I think with sag after particularly adding the AI issue, it's important for all of us. And I think that what people are realizing, what I hope people are realizing, people need to realize is that don't think this doesn't apply to you if you don't work at Amazon. It doesn't apply to you if you're not a writer. It doesn't apply to you if you're not a barista. It applies to all of us whose lives have become, which is the vast majority of us, whose lives are at the effect of this vulture capitalism and what it has become in this country. Yeah. Um, speaking of Andrew Yang and unique candidates or outsiders, you yourself are an outsider. Outside um, what? I will outside of the DC mouthpiece, uh, corporate lobby system influence. as it is, status quo that has yeah. taken us to where we are. There's another person who claims to be. Uh, th there's another person who claims to have outsider status, but of course is from like a political <laughs> lineage family. I'm of course talking about. RFK Jr., uh, what are your thoughts on his campaign so far? There's one place where he and I agree, and it's the only place where I've found that we agree. We certainly agree on the issue of agency capture um, and the marriage of you know, government and corporate power and how basically that is a fascistic element. He certain, and I certainly agree on that. On the other hand, I don't understand how that is married to his belief that, you know, as he says, he's a free market capitalism guy. I read the other day that his... Um, his uh, prescription for how we're going to handle climate change is with the discipline of the free market. So, yeah, Bobby and I have a very different view. Yeah, he went on Jordan Peterson's broadcast <clears throat> and agreed with him on that and said that, I mean, and Jordan Peterson is actually in the pocket of oil lobbyists and has uh, channeled their misinformation in terms of climate change yep. uh, and, and, uh, and for... Robert Kennedy to go there and, and agree with him is pretty egregious, especially when considering that he has a pretty long career of defending environmental rights, a lot longer than, I mean, I've been alive even. So uh, very, very strange choice of words there. I don't know where, I don't know where he got that from. Um, but so people are uh, correctly pointing out that He's done a lot of uh, weird things. I mean, he, he gained a lot more prominence in recent years through anti-vaxxer conspiracies, through those circles, QAnon and whatnot. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the writing that has been uh, conducted on your campaign so far have also had uh, a little bit of... Uh, 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 not, not necessarily claiming that you're an anti-vaxxer, but definitely uh, there is... Uh, some questions about that. What are your stances on vaccination? Well, the thing I do agree on is that I don't think pharmaceutical companies, listen, I don't think that insurance companies should be dominating our, uh, whether or not we have health insurance. I don't think uh, pharmaceutical companies should have the dominance they have. I don't think gun manufacturers or big oil or big uh, chemical companies or big food companies or defense contractors should be dominating our policies. I, I think too often, obviously, uh, the profits of pharmaceutical companies are placed before the actual health and well-being of the American people. In no other advanced democracy do they lack universal health care. So you take the top five pharmaceutical companies last year alone and their profit was $80 billion. Meanwhile, we have people rationing their insulin in this country. We have, pe we have people who are putting GoFundMe pages on the internet to pay for life-saving operations for themselves and their loved ones. Uh, so, no, I'm not a big fan. I mean, obviously, there's profit and then there's profit Profiteering. And I believe that uh, there's a lot of profiteering going on on the part of big pharma. And I think there's a healthy skepticism that all of us should have. But in terms of uh, <clears throat> vaccine science, it feels like, to me at least, and I'm the, the layman, I'm not very intelligent. It seems like uh, the people that are supposed to be ensuring that every single person is inoculated uh, have... Uh, the, the science behind it seems sound to someone yeah, like and myself. And there's risk associated with every vaccine, and we know that. 
Yeah, so overall, I, I feel as though it is an objective good. I mean, even Donald Trump with his Operation Warp Speed, this is one of the Absolutely. few instances where I feel like uh, this was the government operating in a way that it was supposed to. And there was definitely negative consequences associated with that, but that wasn't necessarily uh, vaccine injuries, but more so not allowing this vaccine IP to uh, reach, uh, you know, poor countries, poor countries, yeah, all of shutting that. that off. Bill Gates got a lot of criticism and people said, oh, he's trying to chip people all the way, ranging from conspiracies all the way to like 5G waves, uh, you know, killing people or whatever. But the real thing that people should have been upset uh, about in terms of Bill Gates's personal position on the vaccine was him stopping um, uh, Oxford from releasing the patents mm -hmm. and uh, forcing right. uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine to maintain its IP control, Absolutely. maintain its patent control. Yeah. Um, and the numerous amounts of, of misinformation that he spread in terms of how India was not capable of uh, mm -hmm. you know, creating an adequate vaccine and mm -hmm. therefore it would be devastating and would create more vaccine skepticism when India has and is continuing to uh, to to uh, supply pretty much 75% of the Global South with their vaccinations. I agree um, with that. Do you feel like uh, the profit incentive is what causes vaccine skepticism and other medical misinformation well, to thrive? I think, well, I think that there are two, two things we have to look at here. First of all, we have to have, with first of all, there's a certain kind of healthy skepticism, certainly. But at the same time, we have to have a general trust in our agencies, the institutional uh, forces, which are pillars within our society. We have gone to the point, gotten to the point now, where the, the skepticism has become cynicism, and it is too much. The system is too saturated, because we have to have enough trust in these agencies. Now, whether it's the CIA or, or the CDC, it's sort of the same thing. It's like, do we trust you people? So we have to look at the fact with the CDC as well as others, to what extent uh, did, did their behavior uh, play a part in some of the distrust, not the unhealthy conspiratorial stuff, but some of the healthy questioning, like what was going on here. And I do believe that during COVID, there were people who most of whom probably with the best of intentions did not trust the american people for a more to have a more honest conversation and i think that that transparency is always a good idea because let people be smart enough uh, to figure some things out for themselves so i think there was some ways in which uh some skepticism was almost stimulated by a lack of transparency yeah i mean i think uh epidemiologists uh run a tight rope whenever they talk about uh any kind of prevention with respect to uh, further spreading a virus. And yeah, I mean, there were certainly issues with the original communication and, and how it uh, spread. And uh, it was a like there was of a, panic. there was definitely, there was yeah. definitely a lot of people that thought that, I mean, it was mostly fomide uh, spread. I myself included uh, alongside many others thought that you were supposed to like wipe off your, your groceries and whatnot. But ultimately I think that, um, that, again, stems from uh, their interest in being as protective as possible over a novel coronavirus that is, you know, was ripping especially the, the uh, elder population to shreds. Yeah. So I, I think I give them a lot more um, I think the leeway well, with I that. As I said, the vast majority of them over there, I absolutely believe that's true. Absolutely, I agree with that. Yeah, I, but I don't necessarily agree that it's uh, more transparency that would stop, uh, you know, naysayers and people that have uh, generated uh, and have a, a genuine financial interest in spreading COVID misinformation and then even farm their own alternative products. Uh, I don't think that would have that would have stopped. Can be true. Both can be true. Okay. Um, so. Uh, what else to talk about? So uh, that's uh, nothing's I mean, going on or anything. No, there's a there's a <laughs> well, actually, there is a lot going on in the world. But I do feel as though uh, this has been a relatively uh, less interesting cycle for the election. I think people uh, were way more tuned in. And I say this only as like a media person, I guess, as much as I am a not really a, a media person. 
But um, I, I analyze the way that at least my generation is looking at like elections now and they do find Joe Biden to be old. They find him not to be a, a, a very inspirational figure. A lot of people are complaining about his age and uh, whether he's capable of running again. And um, the Democratic Party has completely uh, it shut off the the like any kind of uh, left wing opposition to that or any kind of person from running against them. Even though um, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that even if someone is not uh, necessarily has a shot at winning, I think that uh, healthy debate is good and and uh, has the capacity to maybe even shift the incumbent on certain positions. Um, you know, Bernie Sanders did that with Obama's second term. Um, I think that was good. Uh, do you feel as though the modern Democratic Party is losing the younger uh, population of voters uh, that feel like uh, Joe Biden is not fulfilling his campaign promises? Yeah, and I think that even what you just said was repeating their narrative. Even someone who doesn't have a shot at winning. The person, it, the person who gives a robust progressive agenda right now, offers a pro, uh, robust progressive agenda, is the person who is articulating what the majority of Americans want. The majority of Americans, both Democrats and Republicans, want universal health care. The majority of Americans, both Democrat and Republican, want tuition-free college and tech school, paid family leave, a guaranteed living wage, etc. So they are so institutionally resistant to a robust conversation and allowing a person who is a real progressive to have that. So, you know, every time we repeat that, that's just chopping their wood and carrying their water. So of course it's boring because they're saying, well, this can be just in a little uh, corner over here. Of course, she's not serious. You know, whereas really someone articulating progressive views right now is the only serious candidate, serious about climate change, serious about the war machine, serious about health care, serious about what is going on. That's what's serious. So yeah, it's boring because the real truth is being suppressed. But when I say the real conversation of what's actually happening in people's lives is being de- uh, suppressed. But you know what it is? It's a, it's a fake boring. It's like when Martin Luther King talked about uh, positive peace and negative peace. He said negative peace is where there's no outright conflict, but there's underlying tension and anxiety. You say it's boring, but that's just because underneath, what's rumbling underneath is people acquiescing, giving up, feeling numb, and this kind of emotional decline. And that's also one of the reasons why I feel young people are ready for something more and aren't buying into, well, she's a long shot or she's a, just maybe she could move the conversation. This is their lives. And I, and I think that those of us who are progressive need to say that. I don't care. Maybe you don't like me for whatever reason. Can, whatever. Uh, for, you know, this, these narratives that are spun or kooky, wacky, whatever, uh, which is, I don't think there's anything kooky or wacky about 68,000 people dying every year from lack of health care, 18 million Americans unable to fulfill their prescriptions, um, 85 million under or uninsured Americans. And no, I have no crystals in my book or in my home or in my lectures. So if people can't see through that I, 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 I love crystals. <clears throat> I, I have. Good. I don't know where they're at. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you but your opinion, not but you you're not. they cookie if you have them in your well, house. Well, it's sexism. That's why. I, oh. I do have the OP buff of being a dude, so they don't really, uh, I don't Thank get hit with that. Thank you for saying it, sir, dude. Yeah, that's just, you know. But crystals are great. Um, okay, so so you, I, I didn't realize. I mean, I thought that you were uh, a, a uh, crystal mommy is what uh, people are calling yes, you, you in a, in a, in a not bad way, in a good way. Spun, well, if I... It wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, well, but it has been used to minimize. Let's not kid ourselves. Okay. All right. Well, uh, w- I didn't realize that you were... Uh, you had no interest in crystals whatsoever. Well, I think they're pretty. I mean, okay. I, you know, I certainly think they're pretty. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, look, I'm I'm honest. I, I had to say it, <laughs> Chad. I know Chad is like, why did you say that to her? Well, I mean, like, like I've... It, <laughs> no, it's good. It's good I've that we're talking. To the I'm, media a, I'm, narrative. A, I'm a big girl. I can handle it. We can I, talk. I've succumbed to the media <laughs> narrative myself. Um, okay. So, I mean, there's more I want to talk about. So, there's uh, obviously a lot of issues, and you're, you're very good at communicating some of these problems, but I think, and I'm not going to carry water for the DNC, the Democratic establishment, or Joe Biden here, but... 
I think Joe Biden also did a relatively decent job communicating some of these problems when he was running um, uh, in opposition to Donald Trump. But uh, the Democrats consistently tell me that they're 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 unable to uh, overcome institutional hurdles. You said uh. that you would need a um, you would also need a favorable Congress. Okay, so let's talk about that. If so we could. some of the uh, some of the hurdles, for example, are uh, the likes of Kirsten Cinema. Um, you are chopping wood and carrying water for them. No, 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 no. I'm. No, I have my opinion on how to deal with that sort of thing. I'm asking you okay, how so you would deal okay, with it. Okay, so, yeah. for instance, you said that the president was very good at articulating this before mm -hmm. he ran, and even to the ex to some extent while he's there. So let's take two examples. One was he said he would raise the minimum wage. Still at $7.25 an hour. Mm -hmm. We have one-third of America's workers who live on less than $15 an hour. Half of them cannot find a place to live. In most major cities, uh, a living wage is $24 to $25 an hour. So the president achieved that for federal workers. Great. And then he wanted to put it in the COVID relief bill. And guess what stopped him? The parliamentarian. Now, let's be very clear here. Republicans do not let something like the parliamentarian stop them if they want something done. When the parliamentarian stood up to George Bush, George Bush fired the parliamentarian. So President Biden was, oh, can't do it because of the parliamentarian. B.S. Secondly, the president says, and he said during when he was running, and he said since, that climate change is the uh, existential threat to humanity. Absolutely. And he has put some healthy investments in green energy into the Inflation Reduction Act. The problem is he approved the Willow Project, an $8 billion oil extraction project on the north slopes of Alaska, which completely nullifies all the benefits of the, of the Inflation Reduction Act in terms of the green energy investments there. Plus, he has given more oil drilling permits even than Trump did, plus the $858 billion defense budget, given that the defense establishment is the single largest institutional emitter of greenhouse gases. So the president is very, you know, it, it's a playbook, which I'm, I'm sorry if this offends anyone. It started with Obama, and it's that the Democrats have perfected saying the right thing, saying what we want to hear. And it was just fine until you notice what they did. And then too many Democrats go, poor baby, he couldn't. And uh, for excuses when it's something which if a Republican had done, we would have screamed bloody murder. And the president, and Kirsten, Kirsten Sinema did not force the president to approve the Willow Project. Kirsten, and Joe Manchin did yeah. not force the president to not uh, fire the parliamentarian and so forth and so forth and I so agree. forth. Um, Good. The, no, I, your, your, uh, opinion on this is identical to mine. Good. I've said, uh, I love people damn near the, me. yeah, damn near the same things. Um, I think <laughs> that as far as the, the IRA goes, I think that there was, uh, certainly, uh, a lot more that the Biden administration could have done. And I think that, uh, potentially the president has, uh, more power to influence legislation than just, uh, sitting back and offering a, a uh, incredible accomplishment to a green senator like Kirsten Sinema. Uh, and I think that uh, as president, uh, you would have powers to be able to Absolutely. persuade uh, naysayers in your, in your, um, inside of your caucuses, inside of your Congress. Um, do you have any opinions on what uh, you would do different? Well, all of those things, certainly, that I uh, uh, just said. The Not just the Senate parliamentarian. I'm talking, like, is there's beyond <laughs> the... the Because uh, here's the thing. Beyond the uh, the Senate parliamentarian hurdle mm -hmm. that was basically self-placed... Yeah, that's just on one issue. Yeah, there are... Well, even on that particular issue, the $15 minimum wage, there is always a rotating villain in the Democratic Party. A rotating villain could be Joe Lieberman in the Obama administration. It could be Kirsten Cinema. But then before uh, we are done with Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin, let's say that they are reasonable. There's Bob Menendez. There's Maggie Hassan. There's so many other senators. Uh, and even depending on uh, what the uh, House of Representatives looks like, there could even be a caucus 
like uh, the Problem Solvers Caucus, like Listen, the centrists no that could... no matter who becomes president, he or she is hoping for a House and a Senate who is aligned with their agenda. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, it really makes me squirm the way we make excuses for Democratic presidents. Republicans don't do that. Republicans have more spine with their... They don't care if it's a Republican president. You didn't do it right. So I'm not interested. I, I think we need to hold our, our um, uh, politicians more accountable, particularly as, as Democrats. So I'm not interested I agree. in a... Well, this is why he didn't, and this is why he poor baby couldn't. I no, no. I'm, I'm sim- I have again, once again, I have my own opinions on how to deal with that. Right. I'm asking you what you right. think would so be the I'm best ta- way to go. Yeah. Uh, well, about in, it. In many things, you can do executive orders. In many things, it has to do with who you uh, who you appoint as head of agencies. Let's give an example. Uh, Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin did not force. Uh, President Biden to nominate as our Secretary of Defense a former board member at Raytheon. He's in there with it. He's in there with it. I'm sorry. Okay? So there are many issues like that. Uh, the pre- the uh, Biden administration could, if they chose, exercise marching rights uh, to lower some drug prices. So there are there are some ways in which Joe Manchin uh, has stood in the way or Kirsten Sinema has stood in, w- in the way and other places where the president has not just chosen to go there. Why? Because he basically is a corporatist el- democratic elite establishment and their playbook is we want to help people as much as we can on the periphery survive an unjust system. However, not so much that we actually challenge our corporate donors who make the return of all that suffering inevitable. Ever since Bill Clinton and the Democratic Leadership Council, the Democratic Party has been trying to have it both ways. And ultimately, you can't. The Democratic Party should stand for more than the amelioration of stress. The Democratic Party should stand for more than, I'll help you survive an unjust system. The Democratic Party, and by the way, to win in 2024, is to stand for ending the injustice. Okay. Uh, one other. That's great. Uh, one other aspect of the injustice or institutional hurdle would also be the Supreme Court. What are your opinions on how to deal with the current uh, 6-3 supermajority that seems almost permanent at this point because they're all very young as well? Um, how how would you deal with uh, the Supreme Court if you became president? I would have a very uh, honest conversation with the American people. This is where the bully pulpit is helpful. Uh, if you look at something like Sheldon Whitehouse's uh, book, Uh, this was well-strategized corporate takeover of the uh, Supreme Court. The way I look at it now, it's basically a rogue institution. We're supposed to have three co-equal branches of government, and they've made themselves into authorities in their mind, not only overriding the will of the people, but overriding the will of the executive, overriding the will of Congress. So as, and first of all, obviously I join with those in Congress who are saying, there's no reason in the world why there are ethics rules for every other layer of the uh, federal judiciary, but not them. That needs to end. I think we need to have a very serious conversation about term limits, because like you said, they're young. So Amy Conan Barrett you know, could have another 50 years of, uh, you know, uh, of, of influence. And also, I, I would not be afraid, as Roosevelt was not afraid, to talk about packing the court. The, the Constitution does not say that it has to be nine. Now, what happened with Roosevelt was once he, once he threatened that, they, pull, they, they pull, you know, pulled back a little bit. Uh, but uh, as president, I, this, I would not be pussyfooting around that issue. Now, I also understand those who say, you could pack it, and then when the Republicans were in power... You could have the same problem. But but there's just so much we can take. They are in a systematic trajectory of actually diminishing the rights of the American people. I mean, it doesn't matter. Even if if, uh, Republicans pack it back, that's not really a threat considering that they already have packed it. So it would still, it would be in the short term at least Mm -hmm. if there was was a Democratic institution capable of, uh, administration capable of packing the Supreme Court. That's how I see it. It would be a, a four years of, of some level of freedom I'd and like clawing back civil liberties. Have, I'd like I want to see the Democrats have some spine. And yeah. as president, I would have some. Um, what are your uh, What are your opinions on immigration and how Joe Biden has handled <clears throat> immigration so far? I think that Joe Biden is 
doing what he can within a system that is a basically false narrative. To me, the crisis at the border is not, oh, they're all coming in. The crisis at the border, to me, is the humanitarian crisis experienced by these people. The Amer- One of the things I would wish to do as president is to help this country look in the mirror. And if we do look in the mirror, one of the things we see is the egregious uh, policies, American foreign policies in Latin America over the last few decades, many of which have contributed to the economic stabilization in many of these countries, which has made them vulnerable to all of these horrors. So that's number one. Number two, uh, I think we should end the drug war. I, it's not going to fix everything, but I think we need to make some fundamental changes like this that would uh, lessen the power of the cartels, which are causing all of this violence. And we need to do what uh, Congress failed to do uh, over the last few decades, which is provide much more uh, opportunity for people, not only at the border, but many of whom have been living here for decades. We force people into the shadows. There are so many undocumented people in this country who do not want to be undocumented. Our immigration policies force it. Let's not forget, even Ronald Reagan gave amnesty to six million people. When I was growing up, all you had to do was go, you know, walk down to the, uh, walk down to the, um, uh, to the registry office. Look what's happening in Florida right now. Look what's happening to unhappy, unhappy with, with Ron DeSantis now. Like, where, where do all our workers go because of so many undocumented people who are fleeing the state? So people who were traumatized by drug cartels under my administration would not be traumatized again at the border. You were talking about differences with Bobby Kennedy. You know, on one hand, he, said, he talks about the humanitarian crisis. He talks about, um, uh, it, it, it talks about you know, American foreign policy. But then he talks about how under his administration, the border will be impermeable. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're talking about cement here? You're talking about more wall here? You're talking about soldiers? Uh, look what, the, what, what they were doing the other day, pushing children into the Rio Grande. There is state-sponsored crime that goes down, on down there. Uh, separating children from their parents is state-sponsored crime. So I think that uh, America needs to open its heart. You know, unless you are descended uh, from enslaved people or you are uh, of an indigenous people, who the hell do you think you are? Who do we think we are? My grandparents came through Ellis Island, escaping uh, oppression in in Russia and Poland. And uh, I think it is a sacred responsibility that we have as American citizens to honor what asylum means. To me, it's at the core. And also, just one last thing about that. Even statistically, Immigrants, undocumented workers and immigrants to this country do more to contribute to even to our economy than they do to take from it. And I'm really offended by all these false narratives that inform so much of that debate. True. Um, uh, Speaking of uh, enslaved peoples and what to do, you have, like I said, spoken about systemic racism. Um, What are your thoughts on reparations? Well, I'm the one who in the last, uh, I think that America has a debt to pay. Uh, After World War II, uh, Germany paid $89 billion in uh, reparations to uh, to Jewish organizations. You know, by the middle of the 20th century, it was an established principle of uh, kind of international consensus that if one people has done an egregious wrong to another people, that financial remuneration made sense. And I also think if if, uh, Martin Luther King had not died... I mean, we were, we were on the path. We'd had the Voting Rights Act, we'd had the Civil Rights Act, and I think that would have been the next leg of that stool. Um, and I believe that a debt is owed. And I also think that I th- my, my, it, my sense of the American people, and I've talked to people all over the country about this, is not that the average American is a racist, but the average American is deeply undereducated and underinformed. And if the Ron DeSantis of the world are fut- have their way, the future generations will be more uninformed to the point of disinformed about the history. If you had been violently enslaving people for almost 250 years, and you add to that another 100 years of institutional oppression in the form of segregation and institutional, you owe people something. How can we even talk about this? And I think that a lot of white people might not realize if you did through a, through a, a program of reparations, if you were to uh, close that wage gap, it would actually make the entire American economy something like one point five trillion dollars larger. So on an economic uh, level, it would actually help whites as well as blacks. Yeah. Um, okay. There. Uh, hold on. Let me gather my thoughts real quick. Uh, I one hundred percent agree with you on that. 
Um, I think that's great. Um, okay, there is. Let's let's talk about some. Uh, you know, we agree on a lot of stuff, but let's talk <coughs> about some stuff that we might not necessarily okay. agree on. <coughs> So this is the part where it'll get a little bit trickier. Okay. A uh, couple things. I have to address this, obviously. Uh, there have been a lot of... Uh, there, there's been a lot of writing in the media about um, possibly mistreatment of your campaign workers. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I'm sure you're aware of. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, would you like to address uh, what they've written and uh, why they're writing this? Why they're writing it. Gee, I can't even imagine. That's number one. Figure it out. Number two, if you are in a court of law, there are the rights of the accused. If you're in a court of law, those who are accusing me, those who are saying she did this, she said that, would have to raise their right hand and under oath swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And when they lob accusations at me, my counsel could in, uh, could cross-examine them, ask them some questions. My uh, lawyer could look at certain evidence. Certain evidence could be shown to the judge and say, this is not legitimate, and the judge could decide whether or not it was even shown to the jury. So I say that uh, it's like the old uh, uh, Simon and Garfunkel song, I would not be convicted by a jury of my peers. Am I a perfect person? No. And in that last, in the last campaign, I thought, okay, I really, I would raise my voice. I said, God damn, fuck shit. Not at people so much as damn. It happened. But this one and the stories on this campaign, mm -mm, mm -mm. there has been turnover for, as far as I understand. Yeah, as and, far and as you know what? Managers. Yeah, okay. So Ron DeSantis, big article about Ron DeSantis, and you know how his uh, letting go of six people was contextualized. Man, he's a strong guy, and he's redoing his campaign to make it right. Uh, when you look at some of the things that have been done by and said about me by former campaign uh, people in the campaign, given uh, what was true. Would you have wanted them working in your campaign? And some people are really wonderful people who it wasn't right for them or wasn't right for us. We, have, we don't have $6 million. We don't have $35 million. So we have to be very focused on where uh, the money can be spent. Okay. Um, another issue, I, um, another thing that we would probably disagree on uh, a little bit is uh, maybe foreign policy, but okay. especially as it pertains to Israel. Okay. So uh, Israel is uh, America's greatest ally, according to both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, I want to I want to hear uh, in your own words how you deviate away from the Democratic establishment uh, on do. that front. <clears throat> I do deviate from the Democratic establishment quite a bit. Uh, first of all, let me say I am Jewish and I am a lover of Israel. Uh, but there is at this point uh, the furthest right uh, uh, government that there has ever been in Israel. The settlements are illegal. The occupation is illegal. And the, uh, the uh, blockade of Gaza is wrong. Now, that $3.8 billion in uh, military aid there is a memorandum of understanding. So that's there unless there is a Congress, an act of Congress to, uh, to pull that back until 2028. However, the president can and as president... Thanks, Obama. Pardon? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, that, as president, I would uh, absolutely and could, by the way, the power would be given me uh, to insist that that money not in any way be used in a way that transgresses human rights as we as we um, stand for them or purport to stand for them and as we should stand for them with any ally. So what are your boundaries as it pertains to uh, uh, Israel? Like, do you consider Israel to be an apartheid state or is that a bridge too far? Do you think that uh, criticisms of Israel from the likes of uh, Rashida Tlaib and, and Ilhan Omar are, are uh, wrong or inconsistent? Because this is uh, something that the Democratic Party, again, has... Uh, uh, claimed they they instead of addressing uh, massacres happening in Jenin or anything of that nature will turn around and, and uh, seek to punish their own members in their own caucus people that have uh, you know familial relationships uh, of, of the oppressed people and uh, uh, I, yeah. I think that uh, there are laws there are certain laws and certain rules uh, in Israel, which could legitimately be called apartheid laws. I do believe that it is legitimate that there be a, a, 
a safe haven for Jews. However, a, a country that is a safe haven should, for Jews should not be an unsafe place for others. And with the founding, the original uh, uh, ideal of, of Israel was that it would not be an unsafe place for others. And unfortunately, they're actually uh, moving backwards at this point. And um, sometimes you tell your friends the truth. Uh, what Donald Trump did was he went with the far right on, on the issue of Israel. What Donald Trump, I mean, excuse me, what President Biden is doing, which the corporatist Democrats are doing, is hands off, all of that, fear of APAC, all of those things that we understand. And uh, I would be very hands on, and I would be um, taking a stand for equally robust support on the part of the United States for both the security and the human rights of both peoples. Okay. Um, you Well, you say both people, so that's why I'm trying to still understand. Uh, like, um, the Palestinian the Palestinian population is, as you said, uh, under conditions that could, by legal standard, be considered apartheid conditions. Um, are you willing to withhold uh, what we consider aid, but is a defense well, as contract? Well, I just said to you, there is a yeah. memorandum of understanding. It would take an act of Congress to withhold the money until 2028. What I would do, what the president can do, is insist that that money not be used in anything having to do with settlements, anything having to do with um, the uh, occupation, anything that in any way transgresses human rights as we in the United States um, uh, describe them. What is to do with, uh, I mean, what do we also do with uh, the, the obvious, you already said it's illegal, the occupation is illegal, uh, especially in best, uh, West Bank. Um, what is to be done with uh, the, the already existing uh, settler um, areas in the region? We've got a problem. You've got a lot from the American perspective too, because like it, we are uh, an incredibly <coughs> important ally to Israel, obviously, and we do have negotiation power in the process. What the U.S. president can and should do mm -hmm. is make it clear that we believe we, it's not even our belief it is fact those settlements are again are, are are transgress against international law you know it's interesting because when Obama was at Tel Aviv University he did give a speech in which it was clear that he understood what was really going on there what was what the problem was actually effectuating some of the uh, views that he himself articulated um, I know people I know them in Israel and Palestine, and I know people here who do represent a next-generation consciousness about that area. And I would gather them, and I would seek to harness that kind of consciousness here in the United States for an entirely new uh, conversation, and I would make it clear the leadership of Israel would know, and I think the uh, leadership among the Palestinians would know as well that, that, that the United States stands for... Uh, uh, something which is far more enlightened and fair and just than what is occurring now. Um, what do you think about uh, our, our treatment of Cubans and Cuban population, Cuba as a country, uh, and the embargo? You know, it's so interesting. Uh, Batista lost. There was a revolution. Castro won. Get over it. That was a long time ago. And I think that, you know, you've got, I mean, I lived through uh, decades where the hold of Cubans who were so resentful because Batista, they had power in Batista. It was like enough already. Now they have uh, younger generations, uh, their grandchildren and great grandchildren. Uh, this embargo of Cuba is cruel. I think, I think that a lot of Americans underestimate the violence of sanctions. Um, the absolute violence and who they actually hurt. So once again, you know, this is an interesting area, isn't it? Obama began to open it up, then Trump closed it down, and this is one of the areas where we thought that uh, uh, Biden would that be Biden would reverse. Yeah. So no, open it up, open it up. Let people be, let people travel, let people have economic uh, economic uh, relationships, live their lives, and be happy. And if that's where Cuba is, uh, that's where Cuba is. Cuba gets to determine what's going on in Cuba. Okay. Um, speaking of, of sanctions, obviously there are other countries that are sanctioned as well, including Iran, uh, North Korea, Democratic People's <laughs> Republic of Korea, and uh, also Russia. Um, how do you, uh, what are your opinions on uh, the ongoing invasion of Ukraine and what America's role is in the conflict uh, and, and what some solutions President Williamson would have uh, 
uh, that is different than what Biden has done thus far. Do you agree with Biden on his uh, handling of uh, the invasion of Ukraine by uh, Russian forces? Um, well, of course, I'm going to ask you about China as well in a second, but I want to hear about your thoughts on Russia first. Well, first of all, because it's literally the news today, a place where I deeply disagree uh, with the President Biden is on the use of a cluster Cluster munitions. Bombs. Those munitions yeah. are evil. They are obscene. Uh, they are I- illegal according to 122 nations, and they should be according to ours. So my heart is really broken, and uh, we should not be using cluster bombs. And I think Americans need to realize what they mean because they, they have repercussions after a war is over. Children, other innocent uh, civilians killed by them, uh, they don't all detonate at you know, the time that they're dropped and so forth. I will say this. No, of course, the United States does not have clean hands. Uh, Yes, the United States was, you know, pushing too far east with the whole uh, Ukraine, uh, NATO thing. Yes, the United States, or no, I should say, we should not have had the Aegis missiles in Poland. However, this is where I differ from a lot of my friends. None of that, to me, justifies Vladimir Putin's uh, invasion of a sovereign country. And uh, to me, if you're an anti-imperialist, that's you're an anti-imperialist if the U.S. does it. And to me, I'm an anti-imperialist if, if Putin does it. And I obviously, obviously, we need a negotiated settlement. Obviously, the only ultimate possibility is a negotiated settlement. Someone like the foreign minister of, of Denmark has said, let's get together, but it has to be not just not just Ukraine's allies, it's not a unipolar world anymore. It's a multipolar world. You've got to get everybody here. You've got to have China, you've got to have uh, India, Brazil, and so forth. Um, however, I think some people talk very simplistically uh, about what it means to call a ceasefire. The United States does not have the power to just walk in there and say, hey, guys, stop, okay? If you were simply to, uh, if the West were simply to withhold all aid at this point, military aid, then t- to, uh, to the, the, the peace would not be the result. It would simply be uh, the avenue by which um, uh, Putin would crush Ukraine. So no, I'm not on with that. I would like to see it be a negotiated settlement in which Ukraine has any Ukraine to negotiate. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I... I I guess I I do agree that if the United States would withhold all arms from Ukraine (laughs) tomorrow, that uh, this would be absolutely devastating for Ukraine. I I, I don't disagree with that, Um, except due to that reality, I think that they have a lot more power in the negotiations process uh, in terms of like uh, issuing a terms of ceasefire. uh, Then, you know, but what does that look like? I don't understand quite what that would look like to whom. We don't have the, the power to dictate that to Putin. Who are you saying we're dictating yeah, those terms um, to? Yeah, there's a well. That's why you have to have China at the table as well. But well, o- ultimately, hold on. Xi went to Russia. We were hoping for that. I was yeah. hoping for that. Xi went to Russia. Uh, he spoke with uh, with Putin. Zelensky said, "Hey, call me." We were all hoping. Listen, I don't care who can come up with an answer to this. And we were hoping, and they actually ended up with these quite weak principles. So, well, there was a fifteen point <clears throat> plan negotiated in Turkey in uh, in the earlier version of the invasion uh, that <coughs> that was um, that seemingly was uh, a little bit more prosperous. Zelensky is himself even conceded to uh, pushing Crimea later down uh, uh you know to like a like a 15 year program for Crimea where he would like have another uh democratic vote on mm-hmm. on uh how to uh best continue on with those negotiations yeah. that all fell apart when uh Boris Johnson visited uh, Ukraine and I don't think that uh England has any sort of agency in this conversation beyond uh operating as a mouthpiece for the American yeah, State Department. Yeah, and then there's that interview with Naftali Bennett and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I don't think you have to excuse the United States to um, stand for the sovereignty of Ukraine. Yeah, I, I, I'm just saying that like there was yeah. a, there was a peace negotiation with, with, uh, with a 15-point plan. I don't plan. disagree with that. Um, so, okay, so um, that's, uh, that's <coughs> Russia and Ukraine. You talked about multipolarity. Uh, so w- what is your opinion on the current administration dealing with China, and what would you do differently? We need to walk back the Cold War talk. 
we need to completely shift the paradigm of foreign relations. You know, this is, we, we skirt disaster. We skirt disaster when it comes to the environment. We skirt disaster when it comes to the economy. We skirt disaster when it comes to people's lives and healthcare. We skirt disaster when it comes to, uh, to war. We absolutely must move from an ab- oppositional, adversarial role with other powers once again. Like, like you and I both agreed, it's a multipolar world now. We're not the only superpower. And it's our own fault, by the way. It's our own fault. We squandered our moral authority. We, we squandered our military respect. And, hey, we left a lot of openings for China to just walk right in there in terms of their... I, mean, I don't necessarily level. feel like it's a bad thing, to be fair. Um, no, no, I'm not even... Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I hear that, too, when I say it's our fault. Like, no, I, 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 I don't... I won't... I don't have a problem with what you just said. Okay, but the point is now, we need to find a way to move to a collaborative paradigm. We need it in terms of nuclear uh, war. We need it in terms of, of climate change. And we need it more and more every day in terms of AI. So uh, we have to stop it with this. You know, I look at American foreign policy over the last 50 years as toxic masculinity writ large. Cowboys going out, guns are blazing, so immature so lacking in wisdom. We must learn how to wage peace and we must learn how to have a far more humble and respectful relationship with other nations. Okay. So you're, you're in disagreement with the current uh, uh, foreign policy perspectives on China that seemingly is bipartisan and it's like xenophobia, that China is uh, bad, evil, Well, uh, there have terrifying. been some efforts when Yellen was there and Blinken. I mean, I think they're making uh, efforts for economic collaboration, which is necessary. I mean, that's an I ongoing thing, regardless of what American media or the State Department says. It's like inevitable that we are um, always going to collaborate with them. They're a massively valuable trade partner. <coughs> um, it's more so just saber rattling, in my opinion. But um, yeah, yeah, there's that's you you differ on that front is what you're differ saying from from not me. I'm saying from the the current administration. I mean, the because I feel like those conversations as it pertains to trade are ones that are not necessarily uh, changing a- attitudes in any meaningful capacity. It's more so a reassurance. It's n- not dissimilar to America's opinion on uh, you know, China being uh, a uh, one state, a unified state with uh, two separate systems, whether it, uh, I mean, with Taiwan, for Taiwan. example, which is uh, the, there's always been since the Nixon era, the, the American attitude towards China has always been like, yeah, we're gonna, we're not gonna do anything. Uh, we are no longer recognizing Taiwan as the real China. Um, and uh, it's, it's just autonomous region while also simultaneously giving uh, arms to uh, Taiwan and uh, trying to uh, massage any kind of uh, interest that there may be in the public. And oftentimes this is uh, not dissimilar to the, uh, the Arab spring, uh, real legitimate interest in emancipation or, um, or, or uh, wanting to become independent, um, beefing up uh, these, uh, different groups in a collaborative effort to utilize uh, an area with historic conflict uh, while simultaneously claiming that uh, you're on board with it due to trade relations. Um, I feel like the trade relations stuff is, I got really convoluted there. Uh, The trade relations stuff is just the norm that's always going to happen. But as far as our, uh, as far as uh, dealing with China as a, a partner it seems you are on board with well, seeing them as an equal. Said, you, you've said repeatedly that the um, economic relationship is ongoing. War with China would certainly interrupt that. Yeah. So, you know, in order to protect the ongoing uh, trajectory of economic relationships with China, which is an important collaboration, uh, we we need to make sure that we walk back from, from this crazy cowboy talk, including that about Taiwan. Okay. Um... All right. Well, we uh, that about does it because your your uh, <coughs> PR person do? was telling me. I mean, I think you you did a great job. You know, I, I this was not meant to be a contentious interview, no, regardless, because no, I think you're that great. we do I'm, agree I'm on your, a lot. I'm your so. yeah, I'm your fan. 
Yeah, this is, of course, a unique situation overall, though, with uh, the chat and everything. So I can't read. I don't have my glasses on. For no, one that's thing, good. That's actually a good thing. I always tell people not to look at chat. Uh, yeah, I can't anyway. read. It's going too fast. I don't have my glasses on. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for coming. Thank you so um, much. Bye, everybody. All right. Thank you. All right. I'll walk you out. All right, chat. We're going to go back to Oppenheimer's Secret City, explained in a moment. 